Welcome to the podcast that will teach you how to successfully invest in and build steady streams of passive income from the highly lucrative niche of mobile home park investing. Veteran real estate investors Kevin Bupp and Charles Dehart from Mobile Home Park Academy will personally share with you the valuable lessons they've learned along their journey as mobile home park investors so that you too can learn how to build massive cash flow and huge profits from this extremely lucrative niche. So without further ado, let's welcome your hosts for today's show, Kevin Bupp and Charles Dehart. Welcome, guys and gals, to the Mobile Home Park Investing Weekly Podcast, where we'll provide all the information that you need to know to successfully locate, negotiate, close on it, and make huge profits from the lucrative niche of mobile home park investing. I'm your host, Kevin Bupp, and today I'll be joined by mobile home park investor and fund manager, Damon Bergamashi from Dammers Capital. Uh, Damon is the co-founder of Dammers Capital, a data-obsessed group of investors who dedicated tens of thousands of hours optimizing investment systems and portfolios with the objective of obtaining financial freedom for their families. After effectively managing their own money for nearly a decade, Damaris built technology to allow friends and family to invest alongside the founders. Damien is also passionate about helping clients discover the incredibly simple math of financial independence while guiding them towards their financial number, the amount of capital anyone needs to invest uh, relative to their expenses, making it less daunting to pursue their life's true passions. Now, guys, I'm excited to get onto the show with Damien, but before we do, I have a few housekeeping items I want to run through really quickly. But first and foremost, as you probably have heard the last couple of episodes, we recently launched our most recent partnership opportunity here at Sunrise Capital Investors. And so if you're an accredited investor who has an interest in not only this niche, but also partnering with a team that has a proven track record in the mobile home park space, then take a few minutes and go visit our website. You can get more details about this opportunity. Our website is sunrisecapitalinvestors.com. You can click on the investor tab up in the right-hand corner. That will take you to our secure investor portal where you can download uh, the offering docs, PPM and such, and and review all that at your leisure. Uh, We currently have eight deals in contract today and in, in, in different uh, stages of contract, uh, one that's going to be closing here in the next two weeks, and then a lot more following thereafter. And we've also got a lot of our things in the pike, uh, coming down the pike. We're always marketing, always out there talking to owners and brokers. And so we've got a lot of momentum built, a lot of great opportunities that we're working on today. In addition to that, guys, as we grow this company, we've got lots of deals in contract. Uh, We've got a lot of things happening here. We're just we're in a growing stage. We're probably going to double in size this year as far as the, the size of our sheer portfolio, the number of units that we have. And so with that growth comes a need to actually grow our internal team and our operations. And so we're currently seeking some incredibly talented folks to join our team here at Sunrise. If you have any interest whatsoever in, in seeing what we're all about, what we're doing here, and potentially joining our team, you can go to a landing page we created specifically for career opportunities. And that landing page is careers.sunrisecapitalinvestors.com. It'll have all the current job openings that we have. I know we're hiring some operational folks as well as acquisition team members. We'd love to hear from you if you have an interest in what we have going on here. Last but not least, we have an awesome free gift that uh, we just started offering, I think maybe two or three episodes ago uh, to all you loyal listeners. Last year, in October, October 2017, we conducted an on-site due diligence training at one of our mobile home parks, one that we had just purchased in Florida. It's in central Florida. And we actually recorded the entire training. And now we're offering it free to you. No catches, no strings attached whatsoever. We actually had over 40 people do this training with us, this due diligence training that paid nearly $1,000 to attend the event. It was a two-day event. And essentially what we did is we, we've taken the on-site portion of that training where we spent over two hours inside this mobile home community that we had just purchased. And we put it into a, a nice pretty video for you guys to access for free. So if you have an interest in this business and you're just getting your feet wet in the business and trying to figure out what to do next, well, due diligence is a big component. You have to know how to buy right and you have to know how to uncover any of the gotchas in the deal. And so this is a great video to get you started. Again, absolutely free, no catch whatsoever. Just go over to DD, and that stands for due diligence. Go visit dd.sunrisecapitalinvestors.com. Again, dd.sunrisecapitalinvestors.com, and you can gain access to that video absolutely free. And so, guys, with that, I'm excited to get on our call with Damon. But before we do, here's a quick word from our show sponsor, Sunrise Capital Investors. Hey guys, Kevin Bupp here with Sunrise Capital Investors. As you are hopefully already well aware, if you've been a listener for any period of time, 
My goal has always been to provide you with as much value as I possibly can through my two podcasts, Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow and the Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast. As our audience continues to grow, literally, we've been downloaded millions of times by folks in over 125 countries. I've had thousands of people reach out looking to get involved in our niche. And that's the phenomenal niche of mobile home park investing. For those that don't know, I've been a full-time real estate investor for nearly 20 years now, and I've personally invested in and have owned apartment complexes, various commercial properties, hundreds of single family rentals, and I've interviewed some of the most successful investors in just about every other asset class. And I've arrived at this one very simple conclusion. Mobile home parks are hands down the best investment I've found to date. Why? They provide investors with the best risk-adjusted returns out of any other real estate sector that I've seen. Investing in real estate can get complicated, and I really want to simplify this process for you. If you're someone who wants to diversify away from the uncertainty of Wall Street and allocate a percentage of, of your real estate portfolio to mobile home parks, but maybe you don't have the time nor the inclination to personally locate good deals yourself, then our team will do it for you. At Sunrise Capital Investors, our team specializes in the acquisitions and management of undervalued and highly profitable mobile home parks. And we are now providing accredited investors with an opportunity to participate directly alongside our team in our up and coming deals. And let me say this, I believe that we are hands down the best in our space at sourcing highly profitable off market deals. That's really what makes us unique in this niche and as investment managers. As stewards of your capital, we truly are aligned with our investors. We've structured our investment fund so that we as a company are incentivized in the same way the investor is, which is through the performance of the investment itself. In addition, we want to make sure that we not only make money for our investors, but that they understand how it's being made. That's why we provide our accredited partners with a private monthly podcast that walks them through the detailed updates on how their investment is performing. And we're very transparent, providing you with the good, the bad, and the ugly at times. And so if you'd like to learn more about the partnership opportunities with our team here at Sunrise, please go visit sunrisecapitalinvestors.com and click on the investors link to get signed up. It's absolutely free and you'll get placed on the priority list of when new opportunities come along. Also, feel free to call us at 833 cash flow without the O. Again, that's 833 cash flow without the O. And one of our investor relations team members will help you schedule an appointment to speak with one of our managing principals. If you have questions, go ahead and schedule a call and let's get on the phone and talk. And with that, guys, I like to leave with one last thought. From the time that I wake up in the morning to the time that I lay my head down the rest of the evening, my number one priority with everything I do, whether it be recording this podcast, working for our investors, helping each of you reach your investment goals, to providing a great experience to each of our residents who reside in our communities, is to add huge amounts of value to everyone that I come in contact with. Now, with that being said, I look forward to the opportunity of bringing value to you through Sunrise and through this podcast. Thank you for your time. Now, let's go ahead and get back to the show. And so with that, guys, I'd like to welcome our guest for today's show. Damien, you still there, my friend? I am here. All right, Damien. Here, thanks for joining us, man. Yeah, looking forward to this. And we've only had a few minutes to chat. And so I don't know too much about your background, Damien, other than the introduction I gave for you there. And so I do know that you're in this space. You are passionate about mobile home parks, as am I. And you've been involved in it for a number of years now. And so instead of me butchering your background and your bio, why don't you take a few minutes, uh, Damien, and, and just share with our listeners a little more about who you are, and you know how you got started in the mobile home parks. Thanks again, Kevin, for having me on. I'm excited to, to share that. I went to school for uh, financial analysis. Ironically, as a kid, I really wanted to be a Wall Street trader. I don't know why. That's um, weird. <laughs> it's a weird thing. Like, I probably wanted to be a trader the same way that kids want to be in the NBA. And yet, when I kind of graduated, it was uh, around graduation, it was 2008, which was the depth of the financial crisis in America. And there wasn't a lot of opportunity, actually, for somebody that wanted to go into that field. And there's actually a really great Mike Rowe quote, which is the guy that does Dirty Jobs, where he says, don't follow your passion. <laughs> he says, follow the opportunity. And I didn't know that at the time, but that's exactly what I did. And I actually did not go and follow my initial passion to work in finance. I got passionate about an opportunity in data-driven marketing, where I became a quant with big data at the time. 
and basically took those same skills that I was learning for financial analysis and applied it to marketing to learn about how to do marketing experiments and things like that. And what I did do though, is I, I, I couldn't turn that off inside me. I was, I, I loved everything about investing. I had been trading and, you know, I was a guy in the dorm room that was trading like, you know, futures contracts. <laughs> and I, I basically did nights, weekends, vacation time, every living minute, reading, researching, and putting into practice investing ideas. And my now business partner, we teamed up almost about a decade ago during that time period. I would research things, I'd write down my ideas, and we'd convert it to conditional logic, which is, you know, if this, then that. We'd organize data sets, and we would code, he would code, and run back tests to see how they performed in hindsight. Some of them were pretty interesting. And then we actually said, you know what, to make sure these are robust, let's run them forward with live data before we commit capital to it, and let's see how they perform. And sure enough, they perform pretty well. In hindsight, we actually wish we invested in them sooner. But at that point in time, we actually put our own capital to work, my partner and I. You know, we wanted to have high conviction in everything that we did. And in order to do that, we needed to make sure that we could control the risk because you need to be fully invested to really accomplish something. But you can't do that unless you have the confidence to and understand what you're investing in so that you can basically be all in. So, you know, we did that. Over years, you know, our friends and family became interested in what we were doing because they knew that we were achieving some level of success at it. And we built infrastructure and technology so that we could basically manage other people's money just as efficiently as we manage our own. And over time, we kind of had this big idea, which was, hey, we can probably manage $100 million just as easily as we can manage a million dollars of what we did. And that's kind of how Damaris Capital was, was started. And I think that makes us very different from most financial firms because of that, because we started with a very personal business problem, which was we wanted to get the best rates of return for ourselves and be able to control the risk. And because of that, you know, we say our clients invest alongside us as opposed to we invest our clients' money for them. So that, that actually has nothing to do with mobile home parks up to this point. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you, when, when does mobile home, like when, when did the introduction to this asset class? So as you guys built out this infrastructure, obviously you need to, it needs to be applicable, right? In the real world. And so you guys had been, I'm assuming, analyzing numerous different asset classes. And, you know, so how did you ultimately end up in the mobile home park space? Because it's a unique one, right? It's a very niche asset class. Yep. Yep. So that kind of takes us down this, this investing path that I was, a journey I was on a little further. So you're right. The technical application that we invested in were different ETFs and funds that are in the publicly traded markets. Our strategies worked really well. You know, my family and my partner's family were very aggressive savers. We were basically just kept putting money away into our, our retirement accounts and we, we had been growing. And one day I sat down and I said, you know, in three years from now, it's not going to make as much sense for me to keep putting all this money into my retirement account so that, you know, for the goal of having, you know, a very high terminal wealth at retirement age, you know, 30 years from now, mm -hmm. there's probably something I can do to improve the lifestyle and fund the needs of my family today. So the first natural thing was, well, why don't I, instead of putting it in my retirement account, I'll put it in a taxable account and manage the money with the computer algorithms that we already coded. Now, the issue with that, though, is in order to go out to the area where there's opportunities all over the world in different markets, and also to proactively control risk, you have to do a lot of trading each month. Mm -hmm. And in a retirement account, there's no problem with that because you don't get penalized for it. But if you're in a taxable account and you want to live off of the income, it's just not like a, you know, you're giving away so much of your edge. It didn't make sense. So we realized, you know what, the area that we need to be invested in is real estate. And I knew I had three years to figure out how to get invested in, in real estate the right way. So that's kind of where it started, uh, Kevin. Okay. So the first thing we said, well, we, we learned a lot from all of that research. Could we apply it to the real estate market? So the way our algorithms work is we tend to invest in things that are in uptrend and that have good momentum and then avoid things that have bad momentum and are entering a downtrend. Interesting enough, even the most simple statistical methods can predict trends in housing markets probably better so than we can in the stock market. The problem is you just won't make any money doing it. 
you'd lose money because the friction cost to buy and sell real estate is so high yeah. and the carrying cost, it just doesn't make sense to do. So while academically we could actually trade the real estate market, it didn't make sense in practice. Mm -hmm. So we switched over and we said, you know, we need to be value investors in real estate, kind of more of like the uh, Warren Buffett, you know, buy and hold forever approach to minimize the friction in trading. And the first thing we did was to look at single family homes in our area. So we're in the greater New York area and we quickly found out that we couldn't get any yield investing in single family homes. That just mm -hmm. was I actually think the renter does better than the landlord in most areas of New York. Yeah. So then we looked to multifamily again, not that interesting. We even looked at apartment buildings and you have huge concentrations of, you have to make these big positions into that. You, it's hard to diversify and the yield still wasn't that great. You know, you, you kept hearing this, well, you have to do it for the appreciation. And that wasn't really what we were looking for. We wanted cash flow, especially after tax cash flow. Yes. You know, there's something in, there's an anomaly in finance that's called home country bias. And we remembered that. And what that anomaly talks about is, no matter if you're in a first world or a third world country, you tend to invest most of your money in the country that you're a citizen in. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Americans put all their money in the U S stock market. Canadians put all their money in the Canadian stock market. And even countries like Cyprus or Greece that don't have, you know, particularly sleep well at night stock markets, those citizens put all their money in that market as well. And it made us realize that, you know what, there's probably not a home country bias in, in real estate, but the way that we think about it is a hometown bias. And in the parts all over the country, there's these massive economic centers like New York and California and uh, Los Angeles, where all of this money is being made and people that get involved in real estate tend to buy what they know, what they can see. That's the appeal to real estate investing. And they invest this money in their neighborhoods and it bids up the price, you know, to its where you can't get cash flow easily. So we said if we could break out of the norm and invest, you know, our New York dollars in another part of the country that and break that hometown bias, maybe we could get better yields. And as you know, that definitely is the case. As soon as you go out of the major cities, you can start getting yield. So, you know, we traveled all over the country looking at different areas to invest in. One of the areas that I went to that was really interesting was uh, that Austin San Antonio corridor. Yeah. That I was, I said, you know, it's a good appreciation area, but the single and multifamily homes there, there was now cash on cash return that was, you know, six to 10%. But after you put in property management, because you need that, because you're out of town, mm -hmm. it got cut kind of in half to like, you know, five, 6% cash on cash return. Mm -hmm. And while that's great, plus you get the appreciation and the tax benefit, I just thought we could do better because even after paying taxes on what we were doing with the algorithm, we could do much better than that without any hassle or adding complexity to our business. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I, I would say I was fortunate. Somebody at my job was doing a private equity deal and I had started doing a few private equity deals, you know, private placements. And this particular deal that came through was a mobile home park. And, you know, I, I was looking at the financials of it, the balance sheet, the financial plan of the sponsor, and the numbers looked so much better than anything I had ever seen before. And I thought it was just a unique, you know, really special deal. And I invested in it almost as a sidecar along everybody else. Mm -hmm. So I could get into the deal. And as I met the manager, learned more about the strategy, I realized that it really wasn't a special deal. It's just a special asset class. And <laughs> asset class is mobile home parks. So don't tell the secret. <laughs> yeah. So that's basically the reason why I found it was selfishly, you know, like everything in our firm was, you know, it had to meet the needs to basically fund the financial independence that, you know, me and my partner were seeking mm -hmm. for ourselves. So you you mentioned, I'm going to back up a little bit. You had mentioned that you guys were obviously looking for things that were in the uptrend state, not necessarily that were on a downtrend. And so during your research and during these last couple of years before you were introduced to mobile home parks, what were some of the asset cl classes that you truly shied away from that you felt were in more of a downtrend cycle? Well, the thing that's interesting, that that's part of the problem when you pick just one asset class, they all tend to cluster together. In real estate, you can think about it that there's different markets and then there's different, you know, mm -hmm. basically asset classes within those markets. 
And if we could build a purely academic system, you know, we would probably say there's like the debt based real estate investment, like, you know, a a mortgage REIT or just, you know, actually I do a lot of hard money lending myself, basically the debt side of a real estate portfolio, which has a little bit of a different risk profile as equity does in real estate. Mm -hmm. And then in the equity side, I would say, you know, there's the manufactured housing, self-storage, single family, multifamily, condo, there's all those, right, that break up. So if you basically take that entire strata and then break it out by region, you can build a pretty interesting momentum model where you say, all right, I want to invest in the top performing market in each of those asset classes equally. And that would give you an amazing return if you could basically buy and sell it. I mean, even seasonally, the trends in seasonal real estate are, are amazing. I mean, if you could... Those kinds of opportunities don't exist in the financial markets where you could buy something in the winter and sell it in the summer mm-hmm. you know, and flip a profit. Yeah. You can't do it in practice. So the macro wise, I think they're still in 2012, for example, things were both cheap and starting to go up. And you, could, you can measure that quantitatively. Mm-hmm. And you know, right now, while we can't predict you know, when it's going to stop or or turn on a dime you there's the odds of it continuing are always higher when it's already in an uptrend so you know the best thing that you'd ever want to do is invest in asset classes that have a low valuation and are already in an uptrend basically the buy high sell higher but when you do it at a value you create a margin of safety that's unbelievable sure. so i'm waiting for my 2012 to come back around <laughs> <laughs> right i time. understand <laughs> So let, let's talk about this, the, not necessarily the, so you ran across or you introduced the mobile home parks due to this private placement that was, uh, you know, brought to you by one of your coworkers or associates at that time. So that, that introduced you to a niche that both of you, I will agree that we feel is one of the best classes of uh, unknown classes of, of real estate to date. The opportunities that exist in our space are abound. And with that being said, I know that you currently have a fund that you've put together that you essentially co-invest with other sponsors and operators. But I know that there is one property, you went in and kind of proved the concept yourself first, right? You went and bought a property, I believe it's in Florida somewhere. You bought a mobile home park. I'm assuming you did this with the idea that, hey, we want to prove the concept. We want to do it with our own capital initially and work out all the kinks prior to launching this fund and, and co-investing with other sponsors and taking capital in from uh, outside limited partners. Is that correct? Yeah, I, we still did that with other with some other people. It was, you know, okay. these, these deals are so big that for a retail investor anyway, you know, you need a lot of capital. So, yeah. but we do have a majority stake in this one. Okay, got it. Talk to me a little bit about that first park there in Florida. How you found it? Uh, what was the opportunity that you saw, and how have you capitalized on that opportunity? I mean, was it a value add play? Was it already a stabilized deal? Just give me some specifics on that individual property, if you would. So I actually found it. It was a deal that the private equity that was the direct sponsor of the guy that we had invested in through that project at work. So he found the deal. I had become friendly with him. He comes up to New York pretty regularly. He does a lot of real estate investing for that Phillips International Group, which is, he's like one of the biggest real estate owners in uh, New York. So he goes up to his spot at the Bryan Hotel, which is a great spot if you're ever up there. And we met up and he said he had found a a new opportunity and wanted to know if uh, we were interested. It was on the water, which I, at the time, I was actually a little nervous because of all the hurricanes. Hurricanes, yeah. So for this particular deal, like that actually made me a little nervous, but it had a really good cap rate. I think the cap rate was around like 10 or 11% if you kind of bought it outright. But the thing that was interesting about it was that it was actually mostly a a seasonal use park. What he wanted to do on this property was convert it to all year round use by taking the RV spots out and putting in physical mobile home parks that uh, were full, full year round service. And the game plan for that was that we could tremendously increase the rent roll. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I could share some pictures of the project at different stages if you're interested for this as well. Sure, sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. And guys, I could put them in the show notes as well. And so I guess my what I'm guessing is going to happen here, at least the game plan or the business plan is to convert it from a seasonal RV park. And then you know, the lot size of an RV park are typically a lot smaller than a traditional mobile home park. But here in Florida, it's quite common that it's probably more of a senior clientele, which means there's no children. It's probably a husband and wife, a couple, 
or even in just an individual. And so a lot of the RV parks you'll find have some more permanent established residences, which are called park model homes. And so they're essentially tiny or smaller, one bedroom, one bath. They're not tiny homes, but they're essentially the same thing. They've been around a long time. Tiny homes is just the cool hip side of the business more than anything else. <laughs> but they're essentially tiny. Is that what you plan to do? Or is that what your, your sponsor plans to do as, as this conversion takes place? Is to yeah, bring well, those park model homes in? So we've done actually, it's almost kind of both of the things you said. I actually think the whole tiny home thing is really interesting. I, I think yeah. as like a tangent, I think that the tiny home angle is probably one of the best opportunities that this space has to get new supply on the market because I think it could change the image of a mobile home park and areas where I see that happening are like outside of Austin. Yep. You know, so I'm, I think in the future and in future uh, fun series, like we actually may very seriously go out and, and look at the tiny home angle. And yeah, I, th- I think there's an opportunity there in the tiny homes. It's just, it's, you know, I guess if you're in the, you know, Austin's not an affordable market. And so there, there's right. an affordable housing demand there, but there's also a, a certain type of buyer or demographic that existed that doesn't exist in, let's say, Topeka, Kansas, right? Topeka, Kansas, I mean, there's an affordable need of housing, but tiny homes aren't affordable. You know, the, 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 right. the typical buyer of a tiny home isn't someone that works $12 an hour jobs at Walmart. It's, it's a completely different demographic. Typically, it's a higher wage earner. They're just living a particular lifestyle or seeking a particular lifestyle or have downsized, but aren't necessarily scratching by penny to penny, dollar to dollar each and every week, which is our business model is typically on the more affordable side of things. But I love the tiny house model. And I've seen some actually pretty unique concepts over the last couple of years come out you know, with this tiny house concept. And uh, it definitely has its place. That's absolutely the, the truth. And it's not going anywhere. And I think it w- works really well in markets outside of markets like in Austin or even like, like in Asheville, North Carolina, Boulder, Colorado, or Denver, Colorado, anywhere in Colorado, probably. Right. <laughs> in any event, go ahead. I didn't, didn't mean to interrupt you there, Damon. No, absolutely. I mean, one of the more interesting concepts I've seen there is actually going vertical with the tiny homes. I don't know if you've seen that. No, I, I, I've not. W- w- more of like the container going vertical or actually like these tiny homes being stacked on top of one another? Yeah, we're, we're actually researching something that we're possibly trying to see if we can work out and maybe do it in an area where the land's more expensive, but we could get that kind of blend between affordability because something really interesting happens with the cap rate when you go up, you know, and this one project that we saw, yeah, it's obvious it's all prototype stuff. They actually take the tiny homes and almost slide them into almost like a storage rack and they go three high. I think that's actually really interesting for areas that have great views and also where land's kind of expensive because that land's not going to be priced for that utility and it's more valuable to you if you know how to do that and you get it zoned than it would be to somebody else that's only thinking about it, you know, two dimensionally. So, you know, just... It's kind of some like an interesting thing. We're trying to think about where does this go? And would you mind sharing a few images of that concept? And I'll put them in the show notes for everyone to look at because I have not seen anything like that, but it'd be pretty cool to take a look at. Yeah, it's definitely on the cutting edge of things. And I don't think there's a functioning park out there. There's just prototypes out that are built. But anyway, I think we were talking about um, the conversion of the RV park to more of a permanent, permanent solution, housing solution. Yeah. So we actually, so far, I think we're at the rate that I last heard, I think we're leasing about a a unit a week right now. So we're in like the, you know, mostly built now, you know, getting them ready for move in phase. There were two different types. One was the type that you mentioned. And the other type, we actually started doing these fifth wheels, which I, you know, can sometimes be called a tiny home. I'll share some pictures of those. Those are really interesting because they fit in the space that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. I think we were picking them up for like, cheap yeah 12,000 bucks or something yeah. like that and they look awesome on the inside you know they're they're small this is obviously not for an elderly person because they kind of have to walk up some stairs to get into those loft style beds but they're being like leased out for you know north of 900 dollars a month Who's and, your demographic with that? You know, I've con- we've considered doing that in a few of our communities where we have like a more of a temporary need to infill lots as we build the more permanent structure in place. And we've considered bringing in a fifth wheel component, but I've always been afraid of the type of demographic that that's going to attract. They're small. I mean, they're, they're, they're smaller than a tiny home. Some yeah. are. There's different sides, different size fifth wheels or some that have like 
one slide out. Some have three slide outs. I mean, some of them are pretty elaborate and pretty high end. But for the most part, the individual or the persons that are going to live in essentially a travel trailer is a completely different type of person that would live in a more permanent type mobile home structure. At least that, that's been my, yeah. my take on it. So give me an idea of what that, that clientele looks like. Yeah, well, I wish I could say I knew more about okay. that, but I'd have to double check with the, the sure. man. Plus, you know, we're kind of early in that getting them leased out phase, but I can follow up with. But you guys are going more of in a more in a direction of rental units, and even with the park yeah. own uh, park models, you're going more of a annual rental or maybe month to month rental component versus actually having them buy the units. Is that correct uh, for the most part? Yeah, we're, we're trying to do lease to own contracts yep. because okay. depreciation and the capex of it just works out better when you just own the Absolutely. land itself. So even on the, like the fifth wheels, you do the same thing with it? Those we have not. Those when okay. we just rent it out. Yeah. yeah. Got it. But no, that's, that's quite interesting. You're the first person I've actually, I've had this idea of, of a, that's a potential good solution for some communities. Uh, at least for us, it'd be as like a band-aid or a temporary solution because those fifth wheels, you can go on Craigslist and, and find them all day long, especially in Florida. For, yeah, you know, eight to twelve thousand dollars units that are only maybe five six years old. Yeah, I think these things are brand new and they're like twelve five. Oh my gosh! <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's a different yeah. animal then. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> yeah, they're they're really they're beautiful. Like I said, I'll I'll share pictures. Okay, okay. Of that. You know, there's also I think there's some flexibility too with those that you know it is it is Florida. It's a hurricane zone, and you get some flexibility to move to move them and not, not necessarily to, to get out of the storm so much because you could do that. But even if you have some you, that aren't rented, you could, you know, swap it out to help, you know, fill in issues with residents and whatnot. That's a great point. Interesting. Okay. So talk to me a little bit about your company. You know, I guess more so, I know that you work with multiple different sponsors in this space. One of the big questions that I get from folks that are looking to either, they haven't made a decision yet. They're looking to either actively get involved and go out and buy a park themselves and be involved as an active owner, or they're looking to be more limited in a limited capacity. They haven't made the decision. I think a lot of people out there are in that, that kind of teeter zone where kind of want to own, but do I really want to? Wouldn't it just be easier to passively invest? So talk to me a little bit how you actually, because you, vet, you you vetted many sponsors to date. I don't know how many that you currently work with, how many different operators and sponsors you work with, but give me an idea of what you look for in an operator because you understand the space yeah. quite well now. I mean, you've been very intimately involved with it for the past two and a half years, but what are some of the key aspects that you look for, key qualities you look for in a mobile home park operator and sponsor? Well, the first one is you know, their past deals. You know, what other projects do they own? That's pretty big because you can see a lot about how they think about mm-hmm. solving problems with the previous parks that they own and the current properties that they own. You can understand a lot about the strategy that they go about with purchasing the parks. You certainly make money when you buy. Mm-hmm. If you can find somebody that's sourcing off-market deals or they have some sort of unique methodology of picking them. Like, for example, you mentioned the Walmart thing earlier. I know there's, there's some people that they only buy mobile home parks around Walmart because Walmart yeah. does so much demographic research that, you know, they kind of piggyback off that. Mm-hmm. You know, you kind of understand their strategies that way. Basically, I, I want to hear, you know, in many ways, part of what we're doing is we're trying to almost cancel out the risk of picking the wrong property, the wrong region, and the wrong manager by creating it almost an index that we can invest into over time. But we do want to make sure that you know we're buying things at a good cap rate that have a good plan. A value creation strategy is, is a must every single time that we invest. You know, we either are looking for properties that are they're under rent. They just have so much upside to increase the rents over time. They have unutilized land. They have a problem that a retail owner can't stomach in the short run. Maybe there's like a massive septic problem that this place is going to be a, a drain for, you know, uh, pun intended for, a you know, quite <laughs> some time. and a retail guy just can't stomach that, you know, so yeah. you get a great deal on the exit on that. Or like, for example, going seasonal to full time, you know, we're looking for ways that we can increase rent drive the top line. Driving top line is definitely the best strategy that we've seen. The first deal that I did, they actually were able to do like a 10-year lease on part of the land to like enterprise rent a car. Huh, interesting. Crazy. <laughs> okay. Wow, that's that's a move. <laughs> so enterprise actually, you know, they built a facility there on that leased land. Is that what happened? Yep. So the value creation part of the strategy is really, really, really important. And then after that, 
there's a few things that we look for when we put our portfolio, because that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to put a portfolio together to create diversification, high after-tax passive yield, and something that we could index into over time. So again, selfishly, I was looking for something that I could put in 25K to 50K to 100K every few months to a year from savings over time, Mm -hmm. as opposed to, that's a very different need when somebody says, yeah, I want a dollar cost average into something versus, you know, this is, I want to invest my one lump sum funds one time. So I needed to do something where you can't just go buy a mobile home park each time on your own with 25K to invest or 50K to invest. I wanted to I thought there was a lot of people out there like me, and it turns out that there are, Mm -hmm. that are diligent savers that would otherwise find it difficult to get institutional access to this space. Mm -hmm. So we built our portfolio that diversified on region, you know, area of the country, the property itself. So multiple different properties in those regions, the manager that actually executes a value creation strategy. So diversifying strategy and person. And then lastly, the term and structure of the deal. So for example, I just mentioned a deal where the yield on it was not good to the beginning. It was actually no yield in the beginning, but at the end, it has a potential for a really big exit because you're solving, fixing a problem. And then we'll take that and we'll pair it with a property that has a higher yield today and a lower exit. So what we're doing is almost like a a barbell approach where we're saying, I'm going to negotiate amazing terms for this type of deal because it's, it's a very unique and amazing terms for this type of deal and then putting them together and kind of creating a smooth, passive portfolio. And I'm always looking for interesting opportunities like that. We're kind of strategic in looking how we can get an edge in this space. So one of the things that we are, we started doing is we started calling up funds and we said, hey, you know, there's a lockup period in pretty much every private placement. And I think it's good. That's actually in a liquidity premium that you generate because you say, it's okay, I'm going to tie my money up. But there are situations where people need their capital, even though that was their game plan to say, I, I, I can keep the capital tied up. And we're calling up funds and we're trying to say, if there's somebody that, you know, for whatever reason has a performing asset, but they need to have access to their capital, we can buy them out at a slight discount. And basically always trying to get a strategic edge to get access to this, this market. And I, I think we're pretty creative problem solvers. Mm -hmm. And we just try to take what we learned in asset allocation, constructing diversified portfolios and data to try to build something that's really good for what we think is normally a a boring, but profitable (laughs) class. That's great, Damon. You know, that's kind of interesting. You mentioned that you're calling up funds and, you know, offering a solution for them to potentially buy out any of their LPs that might need liquidity. They might need to get out. That's it. How successful have you been with that service? Because I mean, that obviously that's one of the big questions that that we get. You know, how long is my money tied up? When do I expect to get it in return? Or can I, if I need to get it out early, if I need to get out in two or three years, um, how does that happen? And um, it's, there's, there's not a great solution for it, especially if you're in the first couple of years of a, of a capital raise and of a deployment of, uh, of funds. And so, that's quite interesting. How, how uh, successful have you been with that service? And have you had a lot of bites on it? So what's interesting is, well, I'll get to the chase. So far, we haven't actually transacted in a deal like that yet. But we are building up a network of funds that now say, thank you very much. This actually does come up from time to time. And you know, we will call you to see if we can work out something. I've actually did have a couple of deals that I turned down that were in, because they were outside of mobile home parks. I get a lot of guys that have, they're they're hard money lenders where they have an underperforming asset that is going to have, it's going to turn the yield off for a while. And they, the investor doesn't want to stomach that. They didn't sign up for that, but they did. (laughs) Yep. Yep. I got you. (laughs) I've entertained it because I do have a, you know, uh, an opportunistic sleeve that we can deploy in our fund, but I have, I've just kept it all in mobile home parks just because I think it better serves. So we're just trying to increase the, the reach of people that know that we offer this part of why, like I started reaching out to to guys like you, Kevin, and evangelize like this idea. And until then we're just going to source deals and invest and you know, that's, that's more of an opportunistic, just the way that we're thinking. Yeah. No, about I think it's great. Damien, how can uh, the listeners learn more about you and your company and what you guys do? Probably the best way is to go to our website, dammerscapital.com. You know, you could set up a, a meeting with uh, myself or my partner. We could talk more about 
what it is that we do. You know, we're we started putting together content and doing interviews recently. So there's probably going to be a steady stream. There already is a few articles out there, but a steady stream of, of content that people could, uh, could reference if they kind of Google us. Okay. On, on your website or just in general, if they Google your company? Uh, Google the company and we're, we're putting it out on the website too. So we're actually in the process of launching our second fund, which is a Damaris Freedom Fund too. So, you know, if anybody's uh, interested, we could talk more about that as well. Okay, fantastic. Well, Damon, it's been an absolute pleasure, my friend. I, pr- I really appreciate you joining me here today. And uh, guys, that's all we have for today's episode. But I, I just want to remind you before we wrap things up here for the day, go grab a copy of that free due diligence training video that, uh, that I mentioned in the very beginning. You can grab a copy of that by going to dd.sunrisecapitalinvestors.com. And again, that took place in a community that we still own today in central Florida. And it was uh, taken, I think, within a few weeks of us actually finalizing that acquisition. And we literally walk you through step by step on what we intended to do with that property as part of the turnaround strategy. And that one needed a a great deal of work, a lot of uh, CapEx on the front end. It's a very valuable video that will kind of give you the overview of how we look at things. You take it from our perspective, look at it through our eyes. And unfortunately, you don't get to see the finished product. We still own it today. So you could always go take a drive through if you're locally in the area. But in any event, it kind of walks you through over a two hour span of time, what we intend to do that property and how we're going to execute on that business plan. Additionally, if you love what we're doing here, guys, I'm going to ask you a huge, huge favor. If you love what we're doing, if you feel like the guests that we bring on like Damien and just the general content that we offer gives you great value uh, in your business, take a moment, go over to iTunes, subscribe to the show and, and leave us an honest review and rating. It really would mean the world to us. It really helps us attract awesome guests like Damien to come on the show. And it just tells us that we're doing a good job, right? In fact, what I would suggest to you is if you have a topic that you'd like us to discuss on the show, or maybe a guest you'd like us to interview, you can even leave that comment in the review section. We always go in and read those reviews and it makes us feel nice, warm and fuzzy when we see a good positive review in there. So take a minute, go over there, it'd mean the world to us. Lastly, stop by the Mobile Home Park Academy a website. It's mobilehomeparkacademy.com. You can listen to all the previous podcast shows that we put on. I think we've got over 90 now up there that you can listen to. So lots and lots of hours of, of content. In addition, you can download a copy of our free ebook, which is called The 21 Biggest Mistakes Investors Make When Purchasing Their First Mobile Home Park and How to Avoid Them. Um, it's a definite read. It's free. You need to read. That's all. I'm just going to say that you need to read it, right? Uh, what do you have to lose? And with that, guys, I just want to thank you for joining us here. As always, it's been an absolute pleasure serving you. Take care. Congratulations for taking the necessary steps to achieving massive success through the highly lucrative niche of mobile home park investing. Be sure to visit our website, mobilehomeparkacademy.com, to download your free digital ebook version of the 21 biggest mistakes investors make when buying their first mobile home park and how you can avoid them. And while you're there, be sure to subscribe to our free monthly mobile home park investing newsletter which is jammed full of valuable tips, tricks, and strategies to help you accelerate your path to success as a mobile home park investor. More information about this podcast and its hosts can be found by visiting mobilehomeparkacademy.com.